Still talking about bride price and how it is a threat to women participating in politics. And if you'd like to join the conversation at home, the hashtag is FastFuzz across all our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter. You can also catch us on YouTube and uh, it's still FastFuzz in case you'd like to recap what we've been talking about today. The legal age of marriage in Uganda stands at 18. But UN statistics suggest 40% of girls marry before 18 and 10% before they are 15. According to a UNICEF report published in 2017, 15% of women in Karamoja are married off at 15 years. The motivating factor is usually bride price. In Moroto district located in northeastern Uganda, this price is usually demanded in form of hundreds of livestock. The Karimajong put a high premium on bride price and many parents look at girls as a source of wealth. In 2018, the Uganda Radio Network quoted Maggie Lolem, the Moroto District Community Development Officer, as having said that child marriages account for high school dropout and poverty in households. Limited education and early pregnancies reduce a woman's opportunities for formal employment if married off early, fewer women in Moroto are likely to nurture and pursue their leadership ambitions. Do you think there is a need to educate not only, I'm not saying just the girl, because the girl is not the one who will be violating herself. Because yes. Dina was sharing a point about uh, the fact that some people misuse mm. the bride price and say, because I paid my cows, I am beating my cows. Because I paid my cows, I am doing this to you because you now belong to me as property. Do you think there is a need to educate the community about the fact that bride price doesn't mean you violate a girl that has gotten married into your family, doesn't mean you mistreat her? Do you think there's a need? Yeah, there's yeah. a need to educate. Mm. There's yeah. a need to educate the, the community mm. to, have, to see that sense of a woman mm. who is fully married to see her not like she's somebody who's, so, who's paid mm. and she can be mistreated. Mm. So there's a need to educate the community okay. about the rights of a, a, a human being or the rights of a woman. Mm. That even if she's fully married, she can't be discriminated against. Doesn't make she her be inhuman. Beaten, she cannot mm. be this and that. She cannot be mistreated. So there's a need to educate the community. Okay. But you find that if I, I find that she has something to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In terms of uh, uh, this married woman vis-a-vis -vis education, yeah, I, I find it really saying that uh, the community needs to be educated. You know, even before you go to this formal education, but there was that informal education within the Karamojong culture, whereby they had their own cultural norms and values tagged to marriage and so on, disciplinary actions were taken in those communities, whereby if a man beats a woman, or if a man uh, does wrong to a, a woman and says maybe, for example, at the end of the day he wants to, to chase this woman away and so on, but they were tagged responsibilities by elders mm. uh, to discipline this person. Not just because the girl is educated or not educated and you want maybe to beat and say she's what? She's my animal, she's my property, she's my what? There were those hierarchies within the, the communities that discipline. Much as there are extremes of men who say I beat you because you are my what? My property. But then within that also if it becomes persistent you find the elders counsel mm. within their discipline. And then also something that I forgot in relation to that, 
you will find that in the Karamojong culture, there is what they call uh, returning back the animals after you have got a, a dispute. After you have got a dispute within the, the family, maybe because of that beating, too much beating, the girl decides just to run away. And when this girl runs away, you will find that the family of the girl and the family of the man come together. And if this man says, I no longer want her because of ABCD, maybe because of her character, and that's why I'm beating her. Mm -hmm. So you will find that there is a refund of animals. A yeah, sometimes, that's, that's, yeah. That's, that's the thing, that's, it sounds like a business transaction. Yeah. You refund, you refund the money in case the product is not working. Yeah, there is a refund from, from all the people that uh, took the animals from that uh, family uh, leakage. So you find that the refund is there. That's, that's a very I interesting think, thought. Yeah. I think so, but education mm. is very, very important, very whether formal or non-formal. I, I think let me also supplement something on what Dina is saying. It's not necessary that uh, there are refunds. Refunds differ in, cl in clans. There are some clans, even if a woman is paid, mm. when there is a dispute mm. between mm. the man and the wife, they, are, they, do, they don't refund. When the woman decides to leave, even if you are paid hundred and how many cows? So it's just certain clans that they, will ask for. Yeah, a, a certain clans refund. Certain clans don't. Cal that's cultural, like the or traditional. Thank you so much for sharing that. And Dina has been speaking about the value of education. We're turning our sights now to an educated woman who's a leader here in Moroto. Christine Akot, the woman councillor of Moroto, is a formidable leader, and she knows a thing or two about leading in this very place. She's in our hot seat today. I am Christine Akot. I am the woman councillor of Moroto Municipality and I was privileged to have been appointed as the district vice chairperson as well as the secretary for finance and the Moroto district local government. Well, when I was growing up, I used to, to live with my mother, who is a rural woman. She had never gone to school, but she knew how to speak some English. But this really touched me a lot, because I was saying, if my mom is not this woman who can go to, to contest or to be with other women who have learned, then what is that stake of other women out there? That thing touched me a lot. And uh, when I grew up, that is when I, I said, no, I should go out there, contest for this position, so that I can help some women and bring them up also. So that I can encourage them and say, no, not because you have not gone to school, that you cannot read and write. That is the reason why you cannot come and attend to meetings, you cannot come and air out your issues that are affecting you as a woman and your family members. found out that uh, I had the support from the local communities, especially the women, they were the ones who were behind me. And so when to reach 2016, I was elected and that was my first time in politics. And right now when I'm in, in that office, I have really learned a lot working with the women because uh, it's always women issues that we put at the front. Although there are some other issues, but the women of, I mean, the issues of women first come. So with this position now, I have uh, networked with many women. I have cooperated with a lot of women. When we go for those meetings, either locally or international meetings or national meetings, we meet with the women and we network with them and we share the ideas. And sometimes we learn even from those meetings how we can help our local communities. Throughout my career is that uh, I have linked many women to programs. You know when you're forming groups for these uh, women, women, for these women, the youth, they come into, into groups. So within that, they're able to share their ideas, they're able to share the skills that each of them has. Because you also remember that the women are very, very timid. 
women don't want to come out of their households. You need to force them. But with this program that I do through mobilization, when you go to the radio, you go to the church, you go to the mosque, you talk to a, a big congregation. And so when they hear about this uh, idea, they come and form their groups. And then that is where they, they relate a lot. Throughout my career, I have realized that uh, the money issue disturbs a lot of potential people who are in those offices. Because when you're there, people assume that you have a lot of money. And yet, even the meager salary that you're earning cannot even sustain your family, cannot even take care of other, other necessities. So it's like a money issue has, has overridden everything. And so people don't look at even the service delivery. They think that when they come to office, they find you, or when you're going to a meeting, that is when you should start dishing the money. And yet, that is not all. We always tell people that when we go to those offices, we are there to give them services. And that is the reason why we went there. So that is the biggest challenge that I find. And uh, also for us see that uh, the money issue might also affect the forthcoming forthcoming elections and it might bar a lot of women from participating because we all know that women are faced with a lot of challenges like uh, they are the breadwinners in their homes if they don't have any money they cannot they cannot sustain their 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 households and then uh, you know that competition that women also face with the men is all about money since our politics has been taken up with money issue on them. My advice to the women is that please don't feel you are too illiterate. Don't feel you cannot do anything to lead or to conduct business. But the only thing is just stand up come and participate like other women. It doesn't mean that you, have, you must have been to class, you know how to read, you know how to write, but even an illiterate woman, as long as the person is empowered, has the knowledge, has the skills, this person can also lead. So all women are potential leaders.